Say goodbye to globalization and integration. It seems like fragmentation and protectionism is becoming the new norm. Trade tensions between the world's two largest economies, the United States and China, have sparked a wave of trade restrictions that aim for each country's own economic gains at the expense of the others. This amid persisting global uncertainties fueled by changing landscape of supply chains and the war in Ukraine. What does this mean to South Korea, a country heavily dependent on imports and exports? That's the topic of discussion on today's GMS Focus with Dr. Yang jun Sok joining us on the line. Good morning, Professor Yang. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's start things off with the French version of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. France has announced its revised EV subsidy policy. It limits subsidies to EVs that meet the country's high environment protection standards. Uh, this is largely designed to exclude Chinese-made cars, but there's collateral damage. Uh, it's just as discriminatory to South Korean EVs. How much of an impact will this have on Korean automakers, Dr. Young? Okay, well, it will have some impact on Korean automakers, but perhaps not as much as we fear. Uh, this uh, first quarter of this year, 2023, Korean EV makers uh, sold about uh, 33,800 cars in EU. Uh, it sold about 14,703 uh, EVs in the U.S. That's all, that was during the uh, three months. Uh, first quarter of uh, 2023, and about 5,000 vehicles by Korean manufacturers are expected to be affected by the French subsidy rule. Uh, so uh, it will be a sizable part of Korea's exports to Europe, uh, but uh, it, it it won't affect the majority of it, at least not, a, uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a chance that other countries will adapt similar rules, and that, I think, is uh, more con of uh, more concern to Korean automobile makers. Mm -hmm. Also, the uh, uh, French uh, electric vehicle EV subsidy is based uh, or it works off of uh, the European uh, Union's cross-border adjustment mechanism tariffs, or what they call CBAM, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that will work as a... Uh, tariff on uh, carbon emissions that are made in Korea. Uh, so that will be another barrier that Korean automobile manufacturers may have to uh, experience. Uh, right now, the uh, CBAM tariffs are scheduled to go on steel, cement, fertilizer, aluminum, electricity, and hydrogen fuel. So not necessarily automobiles yet, uh, but you'll notice that the uh, uh, the uh, steel and aluminum has the CBAM tariff, which will go into effect. And, of course, automobiles use a lot of steel and aluminum. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the uh, French, uh, uh, French uh, rules for subsidy, uh, they look at how much uh, carbon emissions were generated uh, in, from uh, producing the automobile. They specifically look at steel, uh, aluminum, as well as uh, other uh, emissions, uh, raw materials, uh, batteries, assembly, uh, how much co uh, carbon emissions were produced by assembly and transporting the automobile. So uh, the uh, tariffs will, or uh, excuse me, the uh, subsidies uh, will be looking at the same type of elements that are uh, being looked at in the uh, CBAM tariffs. Uh, so that is, I think, the reason why Korean automobile makers and Korean exporters in general who mm -hmm. want to export to the uh, European Union uh, are concerned because Korea generates uh, more carbon emissions when they produce these goods than Europe. Uh, some cities, of course, aren't the only problem. Uh, amid growing protectionism and global fragmentation, countries are also raising tariffs, weaponizing rare minerals. Namely, Mexico recently raised import tariffs on nearly 400 items. This includes steel products, Korea's key export item. This is while Indonesia imposed export restrictions on nickel ore. And this is on top of China's export curves on key chip making metals and related materials. So all combined, uh, how big of a threat is this to Korean companies and the Korean economy? Okay, well, I should emphasize that this uh, growing protectionism, uh, it comes in cycles. 
Uh, I remember during the 1980s uh, when we had the same type of issues uh, and uh, there was a big concern that the global economy will be divided into blocks, the uh, mm. North American bloc uh, based on uh, NAFTA, uh, the uh, European bloc based on EU, and Asian bloc uh, based on uh, centering on Japan. Mm. Uh, but of course, uh, what happened uh, uh, after about 10 years, uh, you had a large globalization push between 1990 and about uh, 2010, uh, and uh, that uh, block-based uh, trade didn't really come true. Uh, now they're repeating that type of uh, uh, rhetoric. Uh, if you look at countries which have imposed trade barriers, uh, it basically comes from two issues. One is economic security. Uh, so you're looking, uh, those countries like the United States are saying they need to uh, limit uh, the uh, supply chain to trusted countries or even truly domestically so that they will have a guaranteed, uh, protected uh, supply chain. And then other countries are using econ uh, industrial policy as a justification for uh, trade barriers, whether it be export taxes or uh, import tariffs. Mm. Uh, the, uh, for example, the uh, taxes on, on nickel, uh, it's based on the idea that if they restrict exports of raw nickel, then perhaps foreign investors will invest in their country so they can develop that nickel and uh, export uh, processed nickel rather than raw nickel. Uh, so will this uh, work? Uh, probably not. Uh, industrial policies and economic security, well, they may work for a while. The uh, 1980s uh, protectionism lasted for perhaps about 10 years. Uh, but it turned out that uh, if you open your stuff up to trade, if you uh, globalized, then cost went down so much uh, that it wasn't really in the interest of consumers or companies to keep this uh, protectionism measures in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that's what's going to happen uh, in uh, 2020s as well. Uh, we may have maybe five, ten years of increase in protectionism, but there's a reason why we had a big globalization push. Uh, if you have a globalized economy, things just are, uh, the uh, goods become just so cheap, mm. uh, so inexpensive that consumers in the end demand that type of uh, globalization. Mm. Uh, but for about ten to ten, uh, five to ten years, I think we are going to have a large protectionist push. Uh, and for Korean goods, which doesn't really have a lot of global competition, where Korea has uh, a virtual monopoly on production, say memory chips, mm. uh, those are not going to get affected too much. But where Korea has a lot of competitors, uh, for example, automobiles, virtually every major country has an automobile production base. Uh, we may be seeing a lot more protection uh, than we saw in the last 10 years. Uh, so uh, it'll be differ. Uh, it'll differ between industry to industry. Uh, Dr. Yang, major economies are also drastically expanding government spending to help their country's key industries like semiconductors to gain global leadership, even if we have a virtual monopoly on memory chips. Uh, semiconductor at large, uh, from time to time, maybe in that five to ten years of protectionist push, we might need a little help. The EU chip sack was the latest in line to take force, through which nearly five trillion won will be injected to boost a bloc's global semiconductor market share. So what are your thoughts? on the increasing trend of such industrial policies that were also once actively sought by the Korean government, too. Yeah, countries are often lured by the call of industrial policy, which makes you hope that you can develop high-tech industries in your home countries through various uh, protectionist barriers, subsidies, and tax breaks. Uh, mm -hmm. Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, and perhaps China are thought to uh, be successful users of uh, these type of industrial policy. Uh, and it's widely accepted by Koreans in Korea that government has to c carry out this type of industrial policy to lead Korea to the next stage in economic development. Uh, and U.S. and EU 
are taking uh, more favorable views of this type of industrial policies as well. Uh, while the recent uh, economic literature has shown more nuances in industrial policies uh, where it can perhaps be successful and where it can perhaps uh, doesn't work that well, uh, it's also uh, if you look at the history of industrial policies, uh, there's usually... Uh, more failures than successes. Uh, you'll notice that countries like India, Brazil, Mexico uh, have been using industrial policies uh, for decades, and their, uh, say, production of automobiles, uh, they've lagged behind, say, uh, other countries like Korea uh, because they protected their industry so much uh, that uh, when they open themselves up to uh, competition, eventually they're too weak to comp- uh, compete with uh, other uh, global competitors. Mm. Uh, now, uh, as far as semiconductor is concerned, uh, United States, EU, they're all giving a lot of subsidies, mm. tax breaks, and they may be setting up some uh, protectionist barriers to limit uh, global uh, imports of semiconductors. But let's remember... Uh, why they lost the production base in the first place. The United States used to be the uh, biggest producer of semiconductors, uh, but the production part of uh, semiconductors moved out of the U.S. market. They kept a very high value added, a very profitable uh, semiconductor design, but production moved elsewhere because, well, uh, it was just too expensive producing these chips in the United States. Uh, high labor and capital costs, uh, lots of uh, regulations, uh, environmental regulations and other type of regulations which made building these factories difficult. Uh, So rather than uh, trying to produce uh, semiconductors expensively, uh, they moved it to, well, it effectively moved to other countries which can do better. Uh, And I think unless the United States not only uh, gives uh, tax breaks and subsidies, but change their uh, economic uh, regulatory structure and uh, have measures to reduce all types of costs, not just uh, taxes. Uh, you're going to see the uh, production in the U.S. perhaps slow down again once the tax breaks and subsidies run out. Mm. Uh, Even though you said it might come in just short intervals uh, and it comes and goes, the wave of protection measures is still a concern for South Korea because, namely, we are reliant on import and exports for economic growth. How can Korea tackle the issue that's expected to worsen, of course, amid intensifying competition between the U.S. and China? And the big question, can the World Trade Organization intervene somehow and play a role? Okay, well, Korea is in a relatively favorable position, at least for IT products, because uh, uh, the uh, products that Korea makes, not very many other countries can make them right now. I mentioned memory chips, Mm -hmm. but it can also include, say, things like the digital displays, smartphones, and uh, electric vehicle batteries. There are a few other countries which make these, but perhaps not as well as Korea, and uh, a lot of them are made in China, and of course, right now, the part of the goal of global protectionism is to stop uh, imports coming from China. Uh, so Korea is, at least in some industries, in a very favorable position. Uh, but for other industries, uh, those industries which have a lot of uh, uh, production bases elsewhere, um, automobiles and steel are uh, big examples, mm. Korea is going to face a lot of uh, trade barriers. Uh, but Korea may be able to leverage its favorable position in the IT industries to reduce barriers for industries with foreign uh, competition like uh, automobiles and steel. FTAs uh, are one way of achieving this type of goal where Korea leverages uh, the uh, industries where it has an advantage to keep the markets uh, for all goods open. Um, now, uh, how... Will, uh, how will WTO help? Mm. Uh, WTO is not really of uh, much use right now, uh, mm. and, uh, and it's not likely to be of sus- uh, substantial help, at least for the next few years, and perhaps even permanently. The United States has expressed displeasure at how WTO works, 
especially how it deals with non-market economies like China. And U.S. has basically paralyzed the WTO system by refusing to approve offices for the WTO dispute mechanism appellate system. So, uh, say a country has, uh, exp- uh, say a country is uh, angry that some other country has disobeyed WTO agreements and uh, shut its market down for uh, imports. Uh, usually, what we saw in the past was that these uh, the country uh, would take the uh, other country to court in the WTO system. It's called a dispute settlement mechanism mm-hmm. rather than a court. But basically, it does the same thing. Uh, but right now, because they do not have offices for the appellate system, it's like not having judges for the appellate court. Mm-hmm. All the uh, these cases that are going to WTO, they're stopped and they're on hold. Uh, so the uh, perhaps the uh, biggest tool that the WTO has, its uh, trial system, its dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, it had all. It has all the teeth taken out of it, mm. and unless the United States uh, uh, approves uh, the offices for the appellate uh, system, that's going to continue. Uh, so right now, WTO is not really that much of a help, mm. and unless the uh, WTO reforms uh, to perhaps uh, U.S. American liking, and you know, U.S. has been asking. WTO members to submit opinions on how the uh, WTO can be changed. Um, WTO is going to be basically uh, an organization without any type of teeth uh, Mm. that would help uh, reduce protectionism. Okay, so in that regard, WTO would be basically powerless for the time being. Dr. Yang, has there ever been a time where you made an appearance and you said the economy looks bright? <laughs> well, uh, the uh, problem, is, well, uh, if you look at the economy, a uh, lot of it is working right. Uh, <laughs> it's just that for the most part, we don't pay attention to it when it uh, works well. Ah. Uh, uh, we, uh, it's been often pointed out that if you look at, say, a uh, market for pencils, you see very few complaints. Uh, but making pencils is actually kind of very complicated. Mm. Uh, you need to gather wood from uh, South Asian countries. Mm. Uh, you need to uh, make lead from coal. All of these things are done. Uh, all of these things require thousands of people, even just for a simple thing like a pencil. Uh, mm. But, you know, we have no problem getting a pencil from <laughs> a neighborhood uh, store. Right. So when things are working well, no one really complains about it. It's when <laughs> things are not working well that it makes the news, and you have these questions for me. And, and now we're back to perhaps the nature of news. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang, for your insights and, and, and frankly speaking, your deep uh, thought on I, I, the pencil theory is something that's going to stick. Thank you very much. We'll speak to you again next week. Thank you. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.